In this video, I am going to attempt to explain one of the bases of a field I call frequentics. Now, I basically have made this field up, um, but I think you'll find that there really needs to be a set of principles that we can use for describing phenomena in a way that is standardizable. How do we take things like human memories or environments or, uh, I don't know, animals, and frame them in terms of a common data source. I've been asking this question for years and uh, I'm working on a project called Talking Trees. And I discussed this a little bit on the last page of the uh, most recent book that I published called Alma Mater. Now, uh, I do a lot of things for a living, but one of them is that I'm a statistical astrologer, which means I basically run big data and matrices on um, asteroids and I study astro patterns and charts and things like that. And one of the things that has intrigued me about astrology is that uh, not only does it quote work, but you can use it in order to really treat your life or things like that as a very strongly hackable program. So part of a lot of the the uh, kind of speculation on why it works, because I'm you know I'm always asking like why is this not random? Um, how is it that you can look at a chart and uh, with a bit of understanding of what the chart is showing you, basically orchestrate events? And it's not even rocket science; it's super duper easy to do. Um, there must be a principle behind it. Now, in the fourth book in the Full Spectrum Astrology series called Laurentia, I have the first two chapters, and they're very complicated. Um, but I offer a theory of, among other things, gravitation. Uh, it, so if you think about it, astrology is basically built on this premise that space rocks are somehow tied to your life. And, you know, why in the world would an asteroid-like series or the sun or something like that have anything to do with you. I offer uh, several theories about all kinds of things, but the one that I want to talk about in this video is uh, not specifically the section on gravitation, uh, and it's just a hypothesis, right? Um, a, a conjecture, if you will, but um, I'll probably do that in another video. But in this one, I want to talk about disks, spheres, and where we may be getting these meanings for different asteroids and planets. So what you're looking at is basically a 3D um, kind of depiction of one of the things I talk about. I believe it's in chapter 36 or 37 of Laurentia. I'm not sure. I don't remember. It's been a couple of years. But um, if you ask this question, why is, uh, you know, why are planets or, you know, dense enough objects round but their orbit's elliptical. But, but then the solar system, though it's, 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 kind, of, it's kind of discal, uh, when you go all the way out to the Oort cloud and stuff, it becomes spherical again. But, but then past that, the Milky Way looks kind of discal. But then the space of uh, galaxies, clusters of galaxies, and, and even our depiction of the universe is spherical again. Why do we go back and forth between disks and spheres. I, I heard there was some explanation and, you know, it was said in a kind of simplified way that it's gravity that explains it all. Uh, not satisfactory, right? Because uh, if you think about it, uh, if it's a single principle, I'm, I'm still left with the question. You're still left with the question of why it alternates between disks and spheres. Here you have a depiction of uh, what I'll call an event. And uh, in Laurentia, I call these radiuses of effect. So, for example, if you had some kind of, I don't know, thing explode or some kind of event happen, it takes a while for the in, for the information to radiate out from radiate out, excuse me, from that thing. And so, although these look like kind of planets or something like that, don't think of these as objects. Think of them as the results of an event. So at the center of this disk right here, not disk, of this sphere right here, for example, something happened. And that 
something is going to send out its information, its light, its, its, its waves or whatever in all directions until it collides with something else that has happened or the results thereof. Okay, so you can think of these as spheres of effect. They're kind of like volumes in the space vacuum. Now, they're not actually space, and they're not even actually time. They're regions of what could happen, of what's passing through. And there will be this kind of boundary beyond which there's no guarantee that the results of that event are going to be pure because then they're going to start mixing with other events. Now, the tightest packing of such events um, actually gives you something like a triangle. It gives you threes. Now, I've, I've rendered this a little bit badly, I think, because I should have spaced these, spaced these spheres out a little more. But the idea is that you know, as tight as you get, it's going to be you know, two of these spheres of effect touching each other and a third one kind of touching them until they can't, get any closer without kind of contaminating each other's story, right? So we can just depict them as something like tennis balls or something. You can pack them together and you will, you will see that this is one of the tightest arrangements that you have. It's basically a triangle. Now, if you are obeying that kind of triangular packing and you still want to pack more in other dimensions, you can put other events on top. So now this gets me from kind of this view, the triangular, to another event attached to the top. If you have that other event, you still kind of have a um, tetrahedron here, tetrahedron here, a pyramid, such that all four events can still talk to each other with the same kind of, um, I'll just call it attenuation, the same kind of stretch between their wave patterns. Here's the problem. The problem is if you do this both at the top of your original triangle of events and at the bottom of your original triangle events, the top and the bottom events actually don't touch each other at, they don't touch each other at the same, we'll just call it distance. But again, this is more like event distance. So note that if you're gonna obey this tight packing, uh, with respect to maybe the central region, maybe you are an experiencer of different potential spheres of effect around you. Tightest ones will be on the horizon, and then vertically in the azimuth, you're gonna have these other two. They're not close enough. So what happens in this system of five is that you're gonna get different kinds of dynamics. And I actually uh, kind of have these dynamics we can explode them. Uh, actually, actually, let me see if I, I don't really want to do that one yet. Okay. So if you explode these, then what, what occurs is that if you're sitting in the center of this triangle here, then you're subject to whatever forces are kind of doing this ring thing around you. So you can imagine that events in the triangular plane are going to want to spin. Uh, they're closer and they can, ex in theory, they can exchange kind of, kind of easily with maybe an equal radius of effect. And so you can have some kind of, I don't know, balance view of these other two guys if you're standing on this guy. Uh, that's going to actually have implications for the kinds of, quote, signs or astrological signs that you can, you can look at. Note that this axis in the horizon treats the left and the right alternatives to your home planet, planet, right? Your home event space, whatever, uh, as being equal. And this is kind of like the communion axis in interpersonal research. There's stuff which is, I don't know, where we're coming from and stuff which is where we're going. And um, those are called, uh, I believe, warmth and uh, coldness in interpersonal research, but, but I'm getting way ahead of myself. The idea is that if you're living on one of these and, or you're living in the middle and you've kind of adapted one of these as your home world for seeing things, then you're subject to two other worlds and they're just gonna kind of spin around and you'll experience variances there. Now, as for this upper and this lower, uh, let's say that 
in between here, you have something called, I don't know, the solar system. And there are gigantic volumes sitting out outside the Oort cloud, which are kind of thanks to the Milky Way giving our solar system its dynamics. Now, if you're outside of this plane, then the upper and the lower volumes are going to have to work um, either harder or differently in order to equally contribute to what's happening in your solar system. And so as that unfolds, you can kind of see that you get these dynamics. Now, I've put up a vector field here. And basically what it's showing is that if you didn't have the top or the bottom forces in this triangular plane uh, disturbed, sorry, if you didn't have the top or the bottom forces, this guy and this guy interfering with your triangle, then a simple rotation of energies across these three event worlds uh, is all you would get. And if you were sitting in the middle, then maybe you'll just be a straight up disk. Indeed, that's kind of what we see in uh, the plane of things like the ecliptic or, or whatever other planet you're looking at. But in order to mash the sphere of the Oort cloud's energy downward, you're going to also have to kind of consider what's happening in the top and the bottom. And so the top and the bottom help kind of pull these forces in different directions. I don't know if you can kind of see what I'm, I'm depicting here. But um, can I make these vectors a little bit smaller? So what happens is that the top and the bottom's contribution to our world in the center is pulling us towards this kind of kind of uh, squished plane. And so this was essentially what I was trying to say in Laurentia about that 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 uh, five sphere system. When you have this tight packing of spheres of effect, then you're going to get one world which is discal, but then you're going to get the spheres themselves as round. And in fact, if you're sitting in here on, say, a planet in the solar system, then you're going to experience the, the sum of the five of these guys as its own sphere of effect. So you'll be round, but you're surrounded by a disk. And your disks are in turn surrounded by more round spheres of effect, which include the totality. Okay, so let me turn off this vector field because it gets a little noisy and uh, talk about the rest of this picture here. And let's go down here. I think I'll have to. Actually, you know what? Before I, I turn off the planets, uh, let's take a look at this inner world. Because now we'll, we'll uh, I think, kind of conceive of the planet we're living on. Okay, so now suppose that this is your solar system. It's subject to five different tightly packed event volumes, I guess, um, elsewhere in the Milky Way. And you've got, or, you know, whatever your world is. So you've got what's happening in here in your world. And let's see if I think I move T. No, 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 I'm not going to do that. Uh -oh, let's talk about A. Okay, so it starts off that you're just kind of responding to what goes on in the middle. Um, I, there are different uh, orientations that you can have uh, with respect to the stuff that you recognize as happening in your sphere. If I tightly pack these as much as possible, note that I have several different combinations of interaction. If I'm sitting in the center, I might experience, say, this interaction between here and here as a different wave from, say, this interaction. Maybe this is sine of x, and this is sine of 2x, and this is sine of 2.1x. But these two guys, um, wave-wise or by the nature of the events that occur in them are going to give you slightly different energies. So here's one, here's two, and in the back you've got a third one. And then you've got the bottom ones. Here's, here's a four, here's five, and in the back you've got a sixth one. You've also not only got the real 
uh, physical interactions, but you also have the holes. So you may note that this is a seventh area, this hole in here. This is an eighth. This is a ninth. In the back is a tenth. Further back behind this, you can't see it, would be an eleventh. And further back behind this one would be a twelfth. So that's, that's 12 interactions. And then if you took, say, the top and the bottom as their own interaction, then there is a 13th, okay? Now, if you're living in the center and you've got, say, 13 different types of uh, intersections of different events which are ramming into each other, then you might represent your world at least uh, kind of geometrically as being uh, 13 in nature. But if one of them is your base world, then it can balance with 12. Or you could divide it into five, or you could divide it into four, or whatever. It's almost arbitrary as long as it respects some kind of geometry. So no, it's not the case that 12 signs in astrology is the end-all, be-all of geometric structures. But uh, it certainly is one of the numbers that works for understanding an event packing like this. Okay, so note that you'll get um, one possible numbering in the form of 12 as the kinds of uh, event mixtures that can happen in this space. Okay, now with that in mind, let's talk about how I remove these from the picture. And we can watch the evolution of this sphere. Okay, so at this point, you think you're in a solar system. We all think we're in a solar system, and you know, it's just it's just gravity and disks and you know particles and stuff. Well, it is. But invisible to us are these volumes which are producing different different uh, mixtures of their waves as events clash with each other and render different results. A sphere has as its volume uh, four thirds pi r cubed. But the surface area of the sphere, let's say this is energy. This, this little sphere in here is getting energy from its kind of the rest of its volume that surrounds it. But it also contains energy. Maybe it's acting like a sun or something, a central energy source that balances out the ambient uh, the ambient environment. Well, we can think of that energy kind of flying off of our own event sphere as, um, what do I call it? Oh, surface area. It's the surface area, the surface area flux. Um, so this sphere here is pulsating at some rate according to some characteristic pattern, note sequence, or, you know, I'd like to think of them as notes because that helps me uh, kind of picture that this sphere really does have a kind of character, which is the, the blend of whatever its other volumes were. So there's some music or some pattern, which is characteristic to this particular energy source. So our sun has its own kind of um, emission and absorption spectra, and it, it obeys uh, a kind of different electromagnetic or neutrino-based frequencies than, say, Antares. So out of the surface area of this, you get only so much energy at a time, which is allowed to kind of spit out uh, into the surrounding events. Now, humor me here, and let's shift gears slightly. The principles that I was talking about were more geometric packing-based. They can describe galaxies or, or spheres uh, or planets or universes or whatever. It's the sphere versus triangular plane versus top and bottom explanation. And it can even describe what happens between planets and moons or animals on those planets. Now, animals won't look like spheres, but they're going to be these, you know, these um, complicated directed bunchings of these cyclical dynamics. And the dynamics themselves are what we've represented here. Pretend that now this is the sun. 
because it's going to obey the same principles, right? It's not the case that just because we zoomed out, physics is different. No, physics is going to be the same. Whether we zoom out or zoom in and we're, we're looking at galaxies or looking at quarks, we should, in theory, have math and waves and volumes still work in the same way. Okay, so this is the sun. Sun has a surface area. It also has a kind of specific chemical makeup. And so when energy flies off of the surface, then it uh, basically is able to take this volume and send it out in a flat plane. That's what a surface is. It's 2D. So we're taking this 2D object and the energy that it fires out can be fit onto a flat plane. What is the surface area of a sphere? Well, let's see. It is 4 pi r squared. Now, if you do just a tiny, tiny bit of um, commuting of these numbers, you'll note that 4 pi r squared is the same as pi times the quantity 2 times r, in parentheses, squared. That is to say that the surface area of a sphere is actually the same as the area of a flat circle with twice the radius. Let me try that again. A surface, the surface area of a sphere with radius r is the same as the area of a flat disk of radius 2r. And I've represented that using this animation here. So there we go. So if we animate that to just t equals one. Let, so now what I've done is I've taken the same surface area that was on the orange peel of the sun, peeled off the skin of it and squished it. Remember, remember our uh, our guys here, uh, our spheres. They had that 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 triangular stuff going. So they served to basically flatten our space. Okay, so. At this point, we've got these, these 12 plus 1 regions, except maybe we're the region in the middle. And you can see where this kind of lends itself to astrology, or at least to my, my astro studies. I know, I know. I was talking to some physics, and then people who didn't believe in astrology, they heard the A word, and they're like, oh, my God, he said it again. Right. Well, anyways, the idea here is that those 12 areas now, um, basically combinations of stuff that we pointed out in those regions of intersecting events can be represented here and they will spin around. So note that if my central body was the sun and the sun's not going anywhere, then the sun's surface area can be balanced by something that sits out at around a 2R type thing. And we can call this a stable orbit. You can imagine we could put objects right out here. And if we do, somehow the energy flying off the sun can get a kind of resting point uh, right there at, uh, at the twice radius mark. Interestingly, you may want to see this formula that I used. Uh, the formula that I used in order to, to produce that translation is this. Um, this is the Z component. It was just a way of putting it up and down on the graph here. But more importantly are the X and Y components. Uh, you don't really need to know what's going on here. All I'm doing is taking a sphere and having it still be circular. But, but what you want to note is that, oh, and this, this T doesn't have to be 12 either. The only reason it's 12 is because I wanted to wrap around a certain number of times, but it actually has nothing to do with the explanation. It could have been 39 or 350. But what is important is this. Because remember, the sphere had a radius r. And then when we peeled off its surface area, uh, the, the circle that we got, the flat version, had a radius of 2r. So it's going to keep doubling as you make one of these fluxal transitions. OK, so we're going to have an exponent 2 to the something. But uh, I've also put this t here. And the T basically says that when we're in the very, very, very center, uh, my, my slider here has uh, a magnitude of something like zero, and it turns this whole exponentiation thing off. So there is no flat multiplier in here when T is zero. 
because it's still a sphere. But when t becomes one, this is turned on and this one falls to zero. Okay, so basically that's, that's why I have it arranged like that. This one is the sphere when t on my slider is zero. And there we go. And this one here is the exponentiating disk when my slider becomes one. Now, if you did this again, note that, let's say this is Mercury's stable point. It's not exactly two. Of course, it's not exactly two. There's a lot of space dust and arms of Milky Ways and things like that, which are pulling stuff. But in an idealized world, let's just say that there's some measure of the amount of energy that can possibly fly off the sun. And where Mercury is located is a balance for that. At that point, we can think of the sphere that includes Mercury as being its own sphere. And that looks something like this. Okay. Note here that we've taken this disk. Okay. It says Mercury can fly around here. But the Mercury-Sun combination is its own energy event. And that energy event also is subject to an exponent of 2. Right? And so right around here at 8 is, uh, well, actually, let me, let me turn this off right here, uh, is where Venus can be. You say, well, why is it eight? Well, this is two to the third. And uh, what we'll note is that when we look at this formula here and we did two to the one and then two to the two on a two that was already there, then we get two to the third, right? When I make T two, two to the two is four times the two that was already there, that gives you eight. My theory, and I, I think I wrote this in Laurentia, but it's been a theory for a long time, is that the uh, astral wheel actually considers two to the third, um, what is it? Uh, what do you call it? It's, it's a frequency translation of two to the third. So if you start at Aries, you're starting at a unit of one. If you circle around the wheel, you're actually ending at a unit of eight. And if you circle around again, you're ending at a unit of 64. Why? Okay, well, so that is probably going to be something I save for another video. But the very short version is that if you're familiar with astrology, you know that we have um, three copies. We have triplicities. So we have three copies of the so-called elements. There are three fires, signs, three water, three earth, three air. But, but more importantly... They follow a similar kind of sequence. Aries, Taurus, Gemini, and Cancer are inner. They, they're how an event is handling the thing within the event itself or within the actor itself. Leo, Virgo, Libra, and Scorpio in the next sequence are how that event transfers its energy to the interacting object or the intersecting world or whatever. Sagittarius, Capricorn, Aquarius, and Pisces are basically the medium that is going to change about the original actor. And so if I went back to these guys, oops, that's not what I want. It's these guys. If I went back to these three in the plane, then basically an energy cycle graph, and again, please forgive my radius here. I screwed it up. I'll do it like this to make it a little easier to believe <laughs> there. So an energy cycle graph basically says that the event occurs and it's going to bounce it to something that looks at it, right? So we consider this to be something like Aries. Okay, now surely when we're in energy cycles, that we're going to send out energy, but then our world is going to change. The reference frame is going to change because we have we've changed our energy, right? So when I send energy to you, not only do I send it, not only do you get it, but our reference frame, our universe, also has to change as a result. Otherwise, I'm just going to pile energy onto you and it's not going to go anywhere. 
So you can think of this as self, Aries, Taurus, Gemini, Cancer, hits the other, Leo, Virgo, Libra, Scorpio, and it changes the whole world setup and realigns who has which energy. Sagittarius, Capricorn, Aquarius, Pisces, forget about the signs. They're almost irrelevant. They're just kind of folkloric names for where we're at on an energy donation cycle, which is going over and over and over. But as it goes from here to there, if we're going to resonate at a kind of nodal point, then I might be a unit of one. You might be a unit of two. The world might be a unit of two times that, which is four. And my next state might be a unit of two times that, which is eight. So I've, I've represented this on other graphs elsewhere, basically saying you can think of this waves going. Or actually, it's the other way around, because this is the lowest uh, amount of time it takes to send information back and forth. Part of the reason, by the way, that it would obey twos, th there are several reasons, but another way you can kind of think of it is that if it takes one unit of time for me to get information to you, it's going to take two units for me to get your results back to me. But if it takes one unit of time for you to send your information to the world, it's going to take two units for you to get information back from the world. and it's basically taken me four to get that information from you through you. And this has implications for another thing that I talk about in Laurentia, which is a conjecture on the speed of light. It is only a conjecture, but it thinks about why the there is a kind of maximum perceivable speed for the transfer of information, here's the caveat, on a particular level. The, the argument would be that if you're a quark, your version of light speed is actually different from if you are a universe of quarks or like a human, right? So it may not be that the, the speed of light is constant, but it's, it's a constant scale against your reference frame. Uh, geometrically, again, you know, this system here is eight, but these systems have other systems and the number of exponential combinations that can come out of it uh, just kind of follows. So anyway, that's basically what I have for frequentics. Uh, now, why did I take the time to uh, make this video? It doesn't seem to have anything to do with, um, you know, either astrology or real science even, because right? <laughs> it's basically just conjecture. But the reason I made this video is because the stuff I wrote in Laurentia in chapters 36 and 37 was a, an exploration for me to kind of have something to believe about why this kind of thing happens. So um, I have my, uh, my uh, asteroid research right here. And apparently, there's an asteroid I was working on called Carlos Hernandez. There's also another asteroid called Carl Vesely. And these asteroids, when I looked at them in certain positions in 45,000 charts, I uh, found that the key geometric kind of node point positions which are 180 degrees, 120 degrees, as you've seen, uh, 90, no, not 90 degrees, actually, um, but 60 degrees and zero degrees. When I looked at those angles, which are kind of guaranteed easy in terms of potential space, I got that these words popped up statistically significantly in the charts where this asteroid was in those angles to real planets at real nodes. So for example, you could have the asteroid Carlos Hernandez um, kind of lined up with where Venus was actually stable or where Mars was actually stable. Or you could look at the 120 degree, 180 or zero degree um, angles with respect to those major planets. And those numbers should be familiar to you if you're familiar with Lagrange points and uh, other kinds of stable nodes, the behavior of the Trojans moving around Jupiter and everything. There are certain places where you can sit a cluster of asteroids 
with respect to a planet and they can be comfortable there. And the kinds of angles that you consider in order to have those stable points are things like in what we call astrology as the conjunct, the sextile, the trine, and the opposition. I considered those. I did not consider squares. The square would be something like up here. And uh, in this space, it's really the triangular arrangements that are stable. Uh, but anyway, the reason that I have a theory like this is because not only does it explain how a flat wheel can you know, purport to tell you about your life, um, if you remember our 13 sections, one of them balanced against the other 12, and we had 12 different kinds of regional uh, uh, combinations that stem from the fact that we're squished, or at least the idea that we would be squished between these different event spaces. Okay, well, since you have that, then maybe it's not as uh, mysterious then that when you flatten this thing to a disk, there are 12 somethings or a possible numbering of 12 regions of different kinds of wave intersections happening around here. And now you can start to say, well, then if a space rock is at home in say, well, let me move my hair, my, my arrows here. If a space rock is at home at say, uh, let me capture this. It's a, I don't know, uh, this, something like this isocline, then it's going to be at home with, say, I don't know, this much of this guy's event space, this much of this guy's event space, that much of that guy's event space. And then the upper guys, maybe he has only a little bit of contribution from that wave. And maybe he has a ton of contribution from the guy at the bottom. And then when you put them together, the dude who, or the asteroid that is at home with this orbit, he's, he's, he can be thought of kind of like as a song, I guess. Uh, I know, I'm not trying to be poetic here, but, but the idea is, is that the asteroids have orbits and those orbits represent mixtures of the different kinds of forces that were kind of kind of uh, surrounding our little little solar system here. And so so frequentics basically allows us to take all that stuff that looks like uh, you know human dictionaries and, and words that can't possibly have anything to do with physics and says, well, you know, maybe they do. Maybe they do. I want to go back to one last thing and show you um, an idea that just occurred to me a little bit earlier. And that was that, uh, let's see here, let's go back to this. That was this idea of this five arrangement possibly reflecting some basic principles that you study in interpersonal research. If we go back to kind of this, this setup here, and we pretend that we are our own sphere. So we're our own, we're, we're like one of these, except that, oops, maybe that's not what I want. Here we go. Okay, so we're a sphere too. And we have a home frequency on our sphere. So now imagine that even though you're a sphere, you're kind of like, you, you could be represented as one of these guys. So you actually are an input to some other sphere. Now, if you're one of these dudes just sitting here and everything is framed with respect to you, now we're going to switch this geometric analogy and call it Earth. Again, the geometries are the same. So let's say this here, this one right here is Earth. Then there are four other actors here. Note that these guys were on the horizon, and so they measure things in terms of equality. These guys are squishing, and they actually measure things in terms of inequality. In interpersonal research, you have communion and agency. There's an axis called uh, dominance, basically, and another one called warmth. And so personality measures are studied in terms of, say, 
how close you want to get to other people. And here, let me, let me uh, capture this again. So this one might be, I like other people. I'm getting ready to hand my energy rotation wise over to this guy. This one is leave me alone. I don't like other people. I'm actually trying to take energy from this guy. And this one is, um, this is energy that is coming into our world. And this is energy by way of the right hand rule that is going out from the world. So I'd like to dominate people. So here's my little hammer. I'm taking that energy in. It's my energy. And uh, here, I'm uh, more submissive, so I could just kind of be mellow, just a kind of a mellow individual. And yes, I will put this energy out for whatever, okay? So with respect to us in a frozen sense, you might say that under the five system, that these relationships of more than, less than, or near or far are kind of constant patterns. And those, those little regions that I was talking about concerning interactions are uh, another thing that I wrote about in Laurentia, which give you this kind of 12 axis of different kinds of energy. So there's a, there's a, there's a mixture of wanting to be near somebody, but also submitting or wanting to dominate somebody, but also be near them. And those roughly give you these, these, these mixtures that are kind of like signs. Now, because we may have an asteroid, which likes a whole bunch of this, not much of that, not much of that, and a whole bunch of this, then the asteroid who kind of lives on that particular combination of event frequencies is going to apparently have a character. And that's how you get certain kinds of words corresponding to certain kinds of asteroids. The field is called frequentics. Uh, I believe that if we're really going to save humans as data, if we're really going to build the future of AI, and we're going to start um, programming different systems to not only parrot our words and the dictionaries we feed it, but to truly have motives. They, they can get hungry. They can uh, fear for their lives. They have different combinations of, I don't know, machine learning or AI that they apply in the same way we do. If we're really going to get that stuff down, then we need systems that enable us to not only work with computers as computers, but work with our universe as a giant computer. That's basically what Frequentix is. And I hope this video kind of gives you a reason to believe that when you see uh, astrological stuff actually lining up with the world and that it's not hocus pocus, there is a possible theory, or at least there are possible standard particle gravitation-based, energy-based mechanisms out there, which uh, once married to, I don't know, the science of music and notes and waves that cancel each other and add to each other and cycloids and whatever actually give us the meaning that uh, Mother Nature knew about all along.